Hi, I'm Neville Martin. I'm the editor of Guitarist magazine. We receive many letters every month from people encountering problems with guitar setup. Why does my friend's strap play twice as well as mine? What an earth is intonation? Or, I've just changed the strings on my guitar and suddenly the tremolo won't work. So, I've asked an old friend of mine, Robbie Gladwell, who you probably know best as Dr. Robert from Guitarist magazine, to sit down and go through the basics of guitar setup on a variety of instruments. Robbie's going to show you how, with a little mechanical know-how, a minimum of tools, and maybe a lot of common sense, that virtually anybody can keep their guitar in tip-top gigging order. Robbie. Thanks, Ned. We're calling this first video Dr. Robert's Physical, or this 6,000 note service. We're going to explain how you can make basic adjustments to your guitar with minimum amount of tools and, of course, working facilities. All you really need is a basic bench and a few hand tools, which you probably may already have. You'll need to obtain a few more, of course, but we'll explain this a bit later on. Many guitarists come along to my workshop uh, with complaints ranging from uh, I just can't keep my guitar in tune or the tremolo won't stay in tune or the intonation's out. And all of these are quite basic adjustments. And as I mentioned earlier, with just a few basic tools, you can correct these yourself. Many guitar players don't even really know how to string a guitar up properly uh, or stretch the strings in, which is the most important part of it, to, for, to enable the guitar to stay in tune. We're going to explain step by step all of the procedures that you'll need to know to set your guitar up, to get it playable, and more importantly, for it to stay in tune to enhance your performance on stage. The working requirements are simple. All you need is a small table or a kitchen work surface with an off-cut of carpet just long enough to take the guitar. The tools, well, I'll start with the neck block I've made up especially. This you'll require to support the guitar when you're working on it. What it is, it's a block of pine, four by three, two inches wide, and it's hollowed out to take the neck on two sides. Um, this side here would be for the acoustic guitar, it's slightly higher, and the side for the electric guitar. Of course, we've got the trusty pin hammer, which you'd use for tapping down any high frets. Selection of screwdrivers, um, probably the most important of which will be the Phillips screwdrivers here. Most guitars nowadays use Phillips screws rather than the old slot head type. The engineer's rule. It's important that it is an engineer's rule because they're graduated in the 64ths of an inch which you'll need to measure your action height at the 12th fret. I'll explain that later on. A 6-inch adjustable spanner for tightening up uh, any loose hardware you come across. A selection of small files, starting with this one, which is a, a flat file which you'll use for taking down the overall height of the fingerboard nut or filing down any frets, any high frets you come across. Here I've got three miniature files. This one is a, is a wide oval file for cutting down the string slots, uh, for the bottom three strings. And I've got a slightly wider one here if you're working on a bass guitar. And a triangular one for cutting the slots for the top three strings. Other tools you can use for cutting the fingerboard nut uh, this is actually quite a simple one, and uh, we'll be referring to this later on in what we call the doctor's tips. It's just little shortcuts that I've thought up, which will save you a lot of time and hopefully a lot of money. This is a junior hacksaw blade, and I've knocked the set out of this, and uh, this will in fact be doc's tip number one, and that will in fact come in the next section. A gent saw, you can obtain these with various widths of blade, and they're quite useful for cutting the G, B, and E string slots. Now, the most difficult thing to obtain, really, are the truss rod adjustment tools. Now, here, I've got one that came with my Ibanez guitar, and some of the Japanese guitars do supply the truss rod adjusting tools. This one, though, is the Gibson truss rod adjuster. You can't find these anywhere. 
I actually had this sent over uh, for me personally from Gibson. But a company called Snap-on Tools, which have uh, major outlets throughout the UK, do a similar device. In fact, what you need is a 2BA nut runner and the actual T-bar handle, and you can obtain that through their distributors. See that? Now this is just the standard Allen key adjustment for 90% of the Japanese guitars. What this, well, what I've done here is just literally insert it into a screwdriver handle to make adjustment or fine adjustments easier. You see there. Now, other small tools you'll need are a selection of Allen keys. This one, as you can see, is actually already built into a handle and it's specifically designed for adjusting Stratocaster bridges for height and for intonation. Um, you can, as I say, if you have difficulty getting the right size, you can just take your guitar into the hardware store and um, they'll be able to help you out. I'm sure they wouldn't mind too much. My favourite tool of all, I think, the saves you hours, string winder. Pair of wire cutters, miniature wire cutters, but they have to be the hardened steel variety, otherwise they'll uh, easily mark and they will be useless after a few months. Super glue, this is the guitar repairer's saviour I've found over the years. So gluing down, um, lifting frets and fulfilling any overcut nut slots. Got here uh, some lemon oil, which is very good for feeding uh, the rosewood fingerboards and ebony fingerboards, and it prevents them from taking on moisture and cracking. You'll also need a few grades of sandpaper, the coarsest of which is the 240 wet and dry, and the finest, which would be 1000 wet or dry. A couple of small rubber blocks. To, to help you with it. Triple O grade wire wool. And a wide paintbrush just to help you get rid of all the dust and the muck that you generate when you're setting the guitar up. Inch wide masking tape to mask the paintwork of the guitar so that if you should slip with uh, any of the tools you won't cause any permanent damage. And again a useful little device that I've come up with, which is the is a string retainer. I've made this up out of a piece of electrical wiring, house wiring. Um, it just needs to be heavy enough so you can bend it into this shape. As you can see there, it looks like a, a, a moustache. And this section here goes behind the neck and the strings retain each side. You'll see this in use later on. All right, we're going to go over now to the dock's first tip. Doc's tip number one, making a nut cutting tool from a junior hacksaw blade. The thing to do first is to place it halfway into the vise, snap it in half. Next thing, we need to remove the set from the blade, that is the way the teeth are staggered each side so as to remove waste material when you're cutting with the hacksaw blade normally. We don't require this for, for our purposes, so we'll take, take the hammer, in hammer, place the blade or the other half of the blade onto the onto the vise, and just gently tap the tap the set out like so. And just to protect your fingers, a little piece of masking tape to act as a makeshift handle. So, dock tip number one. We're going to start the setup with a Les Paul Custom. Now, the most important thing, really, are the strings. If you don't change your strings regularly, a lot of the fret buzz could be due to the fact that they're totally useless or totally worn out. Um, before we can go any further, in fact, we're going to have to change the strings. This Les Paul I've played on a couple of gigs, and uh, I know the strings are, are dead. So 
I'm just going to take the tension off a bit. In my opinion, if you're, if you're playing more than two or three gigs a week, then you should really change your strings at least once a week because uh, most of the uh, problems that you'll get are due to duff strings, intonation, uh, funny noises, wolf notes, etc. Now, I've slackened the strings off so they're not going to take my eye out. I'm using a, a pair of wire cutters cut between the pickups. Never save old strings. It's a waste of time. I'd rather cancel a gig, to be honest. Right. Dispose of the old strings. There you go. Now these strings haven't been put on correctly and uh, in a few minutes time we're coming up to a, another doctor's tip regarding installing your strings correctly. remove these. Once I've removed the strings I'm going to have a quick look over the guitar just to just look out for any loose hardware and uh, make any adjustments that are required which would be difficult to make if the strings are still on. Remove the bridge. Actually one, one little point here it, it's quite common for bridges on Gibson guitars to sort of take on this concave shape due to pressure on the case if you're stacking it in the van. Um, it's, what will happen is the posts support the weight there but the actual camber of the saddles is lost because of pressure on top of the case. Now if you sight along the bridge like this I can see that this is in fact actually straight. It's the saddles themselves that are staggered in height and not the actual bridge. Um, so look out for that and uh, if you do find it's concave, you will actually need to replace the bridge assembly. And this also applies to any Les Paul copy that you'll come across. Right, actually, I'll get that string in a minute. Now, check for knobs, scratch plate. Yes, I found that the actual jack socket is loose. I'll just tighten this up. Whenever you make adjustments to guitars, don't use too much force because it's very easy to strip the threads. Most of the components are actually made of brass or, or very cheap base metals, even on the expensive guitars, believe it or not. The gold plating hides uh, cheap materials. There you go. And I'm just going to thread the strings now through the stop tailpiece bar. Also check the general condition of the fingerboard. Look for splits and, and cracks because if you do find any they'll need to be filled with super glue and uh, either rosewood or ebony dust depending upon the material the fingerboard's made from. And as I say any defect like that will need to be repaired before you restring. Another common problem is where the fingerboards start to lift along the edge there. I'll just lift it up a bit so you can see. That's quite a common where the tenon joint swells and the fingerboard pops off at the end and you'll notice when doing a playing test that the last few frets buzz. So when you've got the strings off, check for that. That actually uh, is the sort of repair that we would cover in further videos. Right. It's, it is actually a better idea to feed all your strings through away from the guitar. That way at least you won't risk damaging the finish by trying to fed, feed the strings through whilst the stop bar tailpiece is still on the body. There we go. I'll just put the bridge on a second. There. 
reposition the bridge, make sure that the intonation screws go to the back, especially on the modern Les Paul custom. If you've got uh, the Les Paul with the old style bridge, with the wire retainer, which uh, goes across the uh, intonation screws, then you need, they all need to go to the front. But with this type, the intonation screws have to go to the rear of the guitar. Place this on there. Now we're ready for Doc's tip number two, which is correctly stringing your guitar. The first thing to do, I'll just move this down so you can see this better here. The first thing to do is to check that the tail piece is on correctly, keeping a bit of tension on the strings all the time. Line the holes in the machine heads up so that they run parallel with the fingerboard nut. There's a, a method in this madness, as you'll see in a minute. And then you want to feed the string through from the center of the headstock. So keep tension on all the time. Leave a couple of inches slack. And bring the string around the top of the post, under the string. See that? And then over the top like that. And there we go be up to tension in no time and it's locking the string to the barrel. Yeah. I'll do I'll do this again. Feed the string through. Bring the string over the top there. Underneath the string, pulling both parts tight. As you can see I'm using two or three fingers there to, to hold it in position. Around the top there, with only a couple of inches slack, you'll find that that'll take it up quite nicely. And continuing with that, once it's in tune, we'll, we'll stretch the strings. You do this for all six strings, and obviously for the top strings, you'd uh, feed through again from the center of the head, but uh, it's just the reverse order. Doc's tip number two. Oh, we've strung the guitar up. I'm just going to check the tuning. There's some pitch pipes here. I always do it from the top E. I find it easier. It's useful at this stage if you just put a little tension on the strings just to stretch them in to pull against the actual little knot that you've created at the top there. As you can hear, or maybe you can't, but as I'm pulling the string, the pitch is dropping slightly as the strings are stretching. There we go. Now the next step is to appraise the neck. That is, we need to know whether or not we've got a hump in the neck, what we call a crown, or whether the neck is concave, a hollow. Now, the best way to do this is to actually sight the neck. So if I pick the neck up here and sight down the base side, pull the strings to one side, sight down the base side, I can actually see that there's a slight dip in the neck, slight concave dip. Yeah. And the same the treble side. You don't need to pull the strings too far. There you go. Now, to back this up, because it's not always easy to sight the uh, guitar neck accurately, because the binding may not actually truly reflect the shape of the neck. So I'll just place the guitar down again and by holding the string at the first fret and at the last fret and looking roughly in the middle I can see that there's clearance there. Now if the clearance is greater than the diameter of the string itself then you need to tighten the truss rod to take up the hollow. Right, well I'm going to go now into Doc's tip number three, which is adjusting the truss rod. I'm going to remove the truss rod cover. There. I'm fortunate enough to have the correct tool for this. There we go. Now, if I was to turn the rod this way, anti-clockwise, it'll produce more of a hollow in the neck. If I was to tighten it, then it'll actually straighten the neck out, and if I over-tighten it, it will produce a crown in the neck. 
Now, it's difficult to do it with it in this position, so I'm going to lift the guitar up and sight the neck and adjust it at the same time. Okay. Now I can see sighting the neck and adjusting it here. Also, still a bit more to go. Just a fraction more. You don't actually need to tighten the rod too much because, generally speaking, quarter to half a turn is sufficient. If you need any more than that, then the chances are the neck has uh, got problems that the truss rod can't cure. Yes, now that looks pretty much straight. I prefer to shoot for a straight neck as far as possible rather than one with uh, too much of a hollow in it. Just a slight hollow, just just so you could slip a cigarette paper underneath there. Right, that's fine. At this stage I won't bother putting the truss rod cover back on. The next step is to actually uh, measure the action height. Now, this is very important because now we've adjusted the neck to get the, the, the whole ratio between neck adjustment and action height right. We need to be able to measure this correctly. We do this from the 12th fret, top of the 12th fret to the underside of string. Now on a, on a Les Paul you only really need to measure the uh, action height at the sixth string and at the first string because obviously you can't adjust the action height um, of the strings individually. So this leads me into Doc's tip number four, measuring the action height. For this I'll be using the engineer's rule which is graduated in 64 of an inch. I'll be measuring the action height at the 12th fret, from the top of the fret to the underside of the string. On the 6th string, it needs to be around 4 64ths, and on the top string, around 3 64ths. Any lower than that, and any problems with the neck may show up, and we're not dealing with fretting problems as such with this particular video. I'm measuring the sixth string first, and looking at it closely, I can see it's 5 64th, so I can bring it down a little bit. If you notice, I'm holding the rule absolutely parallel with the fingerboard of the guitar, and I can clearly see the, the divisions of 64th there, and the, the one for 5 64th is just slightly under the string there. Now I'm going to tilt the neck slightly. I'll do it slowly so we can keep the camera in focus there. I'll measure the action on the first string. Now this is reading 4 64th, so we're about a 64th over on the bass side and treble side. I'm going to adjust the action height in a minute, so I'll take, take the rule away and sit down and adjust the action. The Gibson Bridge is adjustable with the two thumb wheels either side of the body here. Now to make the adjustment easier, I'm going to slacken off the string tension, just a fraction. It takes the tension off slightly so that I can turn the thumb nuts there. I'm only going to do it a couple of times, just a couple of turns. That should be sufficient to take it down 164 for each side. Right, now I'll just tune it back to pitch. This is important. Always, between each procedure, always tune the guitar back to concert pitch because uh, with the strings slackened off, the neck can pull backwards under the tension of the truss rod. One doesn't have to be too finicky about that. But now I'll pick the guitar up and measure the action again. There you go. It's, it's always difficult finding the right side. Yes, that's now measuring 4 64ths on the sixth string. Just a fraction under 3 64ths on the top E string. Well, just to recap, so far we've adjusted the truss rod. We've adjusted the action height and remeasured it, and we've retuned pitch. The next step 
is, is to cut the fingerboard nut so that the first fret action height is correct and it feels comfortable when you're fretting uh, along the first few frets. This is going to be Doc's tip number five. The main point about Doc's tip five is the string clearance over the first fret. This is in fact what makes the guitar feel comfortable or otherwise. Now, ideally, the string clearance should be approximately the diameter of the string itself. So as you can see, I'm tapping down the, the top string onto the first fret. And that gives me an indication there. And I can see that the strings are just a little bit high. It's a little bit over the diameter of the string. So I'm going to have to cut that. I'll just check the other strings as well. They're all a little bit high. I'm going to have to do every one of them. Using the triangular file, I'm going to pull... Without detuning, I'm going to pull the string gently out of the slot and cut the slot slightly deeper, holding the file at, a, at an angle so that the leading edge of the nut here is higher than the trailing edge so that the string will rest at the front end of the slot. Otherwise, you'll get a rattle. So I'll just do this a few strokes at a time. Come down a bit more. Notice that the file is tilted up just a slightly greater angle than the angle of the headstock. That's fine. Onto the B string. I've had years of practice doing this, so don't expect to do it quite as quickly. That's fine. If in doubt, just one or two strokes at a time, just removing very little material. If you do get into trouble, you can always put a dab of super glue in and using a bit of 240 grade wet or dry paper, rub over the top so that you fill the slot with dust, let it set, and uh, put the string back in the slot and you can then recut it to the correct depth. need slightly more. It's fine. Now for the bottom three strings I'll be using the oval file. Here yeah, as we can see. Let's pull the string out. That's perfect. the fifth string now. A bit more with that one. Yes. That's okay, the sixth string. As you can see, this procedure is actually, once you're used to it, you've done it a few thousand times, actually quite, quite quick. Right, now that is perfect. The top three strings are approximately the diameter of the strings themselves for the clearance of the first fret. And for the bottom three strings, it's got to be approximately half of the diameter of the strings. So the D string on for this particular gauge is 24 thou. And I can see it's roughly 10 to 12 thou clearance. It's, good, it's close enough to eyeball it. If it feels comfortable and it looks approximately half the diameter of the string, then you're going to be close enough. Nobody's going to complain at all. Now, I've deepened the slots to the extent whereby the string is submerged totally into the nut. Gibson's spec is actually that the slot should be only half of the diameter of the string, just, just for visual appearances. Now, again, I can just release the strings to one side here. What I'll do as well is take a little bit of tape, protect finish, put it each side. Here. Using the flat file. Keep, again, keep it angled backwards. 
the idea is basically just to take the overall height down a fraction. And there we go. Just a bit more. Angle it over the edge slightly as well so that uh, you don't develop any sharp edges when you're playing. So you'll feel it. There we go. For the purposes of this demonstration, that's actually going to be adequate. I'm going to take a little piece of 240 wet and dry, or wet or dry paper, and just sand over the nut, pressing quite firmly so that the fleshy pad of your thumb just takes off the sharp edges and maintains that gentle backward slope on the top of the nut over the edges. It always, always pays to have a good look um, at a particular component if you are going to take a file to it so that you can retain the shape and try to get it back again when you're sanding. There we go. I get to use the brush at last. Place the strings into the slot. We start with your fourth and third string and work from the inside out. It's easier, you don't trip over your fingers. There we go. Doc's tip number five. Okay, the next step is adjusting the pickups. So that you can identify them, I've plugged the guitar in and I'm putting the select switch to the rhythm mode. I'm just tapping the whole piece so you can hear that that pickup is actually working. In the centre, both pickups are working. And in the treble, of course, you just get the treble or back pickup, as we call it. Now, the height of the pickups is very important. If they're too close to the strings, you'll get wolf notes or strange harmonics, or you may even find that the string, when you're playing at the last two frets, actually touches the pickup and creates a horrible noise. Um, OK. The ideal clearance on the bass side is approximately an eighth of an inch whilst holding the strings down at the last fret. I'll do that by eyeball first of all and then measure it. It's the same for both pickups. There we go. Of course, again, on a Les Paul, you only really need to adjust the pickups so that uh, you take into consideration the first string and, and, and the bottom string. All right, they're both okay. Now the top, the top string needs to be approximately a sixteenth of an inch, or thereabouts. That's a little bit under that. In fact, that's dropped almost into the body. There we go. This will give you the most response. As there's less mass to the top string, you actually need to have it quite a bit closer. Again, it's, this is something you can learn to do by eye. But it's always wise to measure it first, just, uh, just to get some idea of what you're doing. There we go, that's fine. Now, point is actually trying to compare volume levels um, of the pickups, uh, especially now that they're tilted. We wouldn't be able to pick it up, we wouldn't be able to demonstrate the difference in volume between the first and the last string anyway. Pole piece screws, I generally find that on a humbucking pickup, it's best to have them lying just about flush with the, with the pickup cover. It, it never really works raising them. It, it, it tends to give you an unnatural tone on, on the pole piece that you've raised. Okay, so the pickups are set to the correct height now. Now we go on to intonation. What is intonation? Well, in a nutshell, intonation is the tuning of the string along the fretboard, so that when you play the string open and compare it to the 12th fret, it should be the same note, an octave above. 
Now, because the top string has less mass than the bottom string, effectively the top string is closer, or the shall I say the saddle is slightly closer than the than the base string. The base string saddle needs to be slightly further away to compensate for the mass. So I'm actually just going to play the harmonic at the 12th fret and then compare it with the stop note. That's just slightly sharp. Now, if the note is sharp, you need to bring the saddle backwards just a fraction at a time, and then compare it. You've got a little nursery rhyme, sharp, back, flat, forwards. That's a good thing to help you remember. It's a little bit sharp. You can do the same test on the 19th fret as well. Now, to help with the harmonics being that high, if you put it in the treble position, pick up slip switch into the treble position, you'll be able to hear the notes clearer. You can hear that's still slightly sharp. So, again, bringing the saddle just slightly backwards. I'll try the B string. Yes, that's sharp as well. In actual fact, I've done so many Les Pauls in my life, I can pretty much determine where they should be once I've done the top E. And they should make two offset rows, two independent offset rows at a slight angle. And this, providing you're using a reasonable make and gauge of string, you shouldn't have any problems. So I'm going to put them to approximately the position I know where it'll work. I can see, in actual fact, just by looking at these saddles, that the bottom E string is going to be very sharp compared to the harmonic. So just to... See, the harmonic is the actual reference note. You fret the note and play it, and that is the note that you have to get sounding the same as your reference note. So I need to bring that saddle back slightly. Correct that. Just retune it. Still sharp. If you're not sure about this procedure, you can always use an electronic tuner, although I prefer to use my ear. And if you train your ear to the extent that you can hear the difference, it'll also aid you for just guitar playing generally. I mean, after all, if you can't hear it, what's the problem? There we go. Check it on the 19th again. Check the others, that's close enough now. Now, that's actually put the tuning out slightly. I can hear that that's close enough. But just remember the golden rule. If, if the note, if the stop note is flat, you move the saddle forwards. If it's sharp, you move the saddle backwards. So you're lengthening the actual string, the singing part of the string, to flatten the note. Okay, now I'm just going to re retune it to concert because uh, I want to check the action again in the threshold setting because everything you do has a slight effect on everything else you've done. Right. The guitar up. down slightly. Find the correct side of the rule. That's spot on 4 fourths. That's slightly lower than I'd like it. That's almost 2 fourths. So I'm just going to raise that a fraction. Again, I'll just increase the volume a bit. Again, retune to concert pitch is always important. After every procedure, retune to concert pitch. Now I'm just going to sight the neck.
Yes, there's anything I could do with adjusting the rod a little bit more. There's still a very slight hollow in there. And now that I've brought the action down, I've cut the nut, I can make the fine, what are called trimming adjustments to the guitar. Yes, in fact, doing that, as the neck straightened out, it's lowered the action this side slightly, so I'll just raise it a bit here, raise it a bit there, because I know that will need adjusting again. Check the relief. If you remember that the actual relief in the middle of the neck should be a, maybe slightly less than the actual diameter of the top string. There you go. Check it on the base side again. Yeah, that's fine. I'll just retune to concert pitch. We do a playing test. Now, to do the playing test, initially you'll need to turn the pickups off because you won't hear the fret buzz through an amplifier quite as, as well as you will do just acoustically. Now, Unfortunately, due to the limitations of the video, we, we can't actually demonstrate this effect, but I can hear it if there's any. And as such, it's actually quite clean. No buzz down there. Just check at the top. You won't need to repeat this for every string. No, in fact, I would suggest you do it slower than I'm doing it making sure that you fret the guitar properly all the way up. If you do notice any frets that uh, buzz a bit more than others, then, for example, say if we had the fifth fret slightly higher, there we go, all you need to do is just a slight tap of the pin hammer, then that generally would have cured the problem. If you need to, then possibly sort of file the fret down slightly and then polish it with it with a piece of thousand grade, wet a dry paper and go over it with wire wool. Okay. I'll just uh, do a final playing test down here. Now it's nice and clean. If I had buzz down at the lower end of the neck here, um, it would indicate that I've tightened the truss rod just a bit too much and that I've created a slight crown in the neck. Now, again, I would have to then slacken the rod off by about a quarter of a turn and compromise between what I see um, by sighting the neck and tapping and what the playing string actually tells me. Okay, and this is actually fine. But conversely, if I played at the top and I was getting bars, the chances are the neck would have a slight turn up and the truss rod, of course, does not work past the 12th fret. The, uh, the active part of the truss rod is from the nut to the 12th fret there. It's in at a very slight angle, and when you tighten the rod, it forces the middle of the neck outwards. But as such, this guitar is fine. No playability problems here at all. So, I'll just put the truss rod cover back into place here. Yeah. Quickly. And we're almost finished. That's the Les Paul done. The next guitar we come to is the Stratocaster. Probably one of the most famous guitars ever. There are so many clones of this instrument, but they all basically follow the same pattern. Um, and in fact, the differences between this guitar and the Les Paul are quite obvious. You've got the bolt-on neck, the tremolo system, although a few of these instruments come with the, the fixed bridge. That's without the tremolo. As you can see here, I've taken the back plate off already. And uh, you've got the tremolo springs at the back there with the back of the tremolo block and the strings pass through behind there. The springs basically counteract the tension of the strings, but I'll explain that a bit later on. 
Now, one of the most important differences is the fact that this guitar has a scale length of 25 and a half inches, and yet only has 21 frets compared to the Les Paul's 22. Uh, as confusing as this sounds, it doesn't actually really affect the playability, apart from it, it just makes it a little bit harder to play and bend the strings because the speaking length of the string is, is about three quarters of an inch longer. The other difference is single coil pickups, three single coil pickups. It gives you a slightly thinner, tinnier sound than uh, the warm, jazzy sound of the Les Paul. Uh, volume and two tone controls and a wafer type selector switch here. Now the same setup techniques apply to this guitar as they did to the Les Paul. The way we carry out the operations vary slightly so I shall repeat the same functions but go over the only the necessary parts so as not to repeat too much of what we've carried out before with the Les Paul. First of all I'll cut the Cut the strings off again. There you go. Remove them. Just repeat, of course, that uh, before you can carry out any setup, you've got to restring the instrument. Otherwise, you can't tell whether or not the fret buzz is due to the strings or high frets. There you go. Now, an important point with Stratocaster is that because the neck is bolt-on, we've got to be absolutely sure that the neck's in at the right angle, at the right pitch, and uh, we'll be checking this out in a minute. If it's not quite right, then of course it throws everything else out. I'm poking the string through from behind here, so you can see. Again, put all the strings through the tremolo block at the same time, because this makes it easier, otherwise you'll be forever turning the guitar over. You have to check when you're doing this that the strings do pass through the saddles correctly. There's a little hole there. Quite often I've, I've received guitars for setups and uh, the strings have come through to one side and then over the saddles and of course you haven't been able to adjust the intonation correctly. So I'll just put the last string in place and uh, we'll be ready for Doc's tip number six which is stringing up a Stratocaster. The Strat machine heads differ considerably from the Les Paul type in that there is a slot in the top of the post of the head and a hole drilled down the center of it. Now the idea of this is that when you take the string, cut it about two inches past the particular post that you're going to poke the string down, cut the string off, you can, as you see, you can pass the string down through into the hole and bend the string over at right angles there. Just see if you can see that. Just take the string winder. Very soon you'll be up to tension. There we go. You want about two inches for the E, A, and D string. So sort of over, over and above the length you'd require just to pass it. There we go. Do the same here. On the top three strings, the G, B, and E, you've got about three inches. So you've got just a bit more slack. That's Doc's tip number six. Well, I've finished stringing the strat up. And I'm just going to quickly check the neck relief, as we did with the Les Paul, by sighting it. Well, I can see immediately, sighting down the actual ends of the fret, that the neck has got a slight hollow to it. And as before, I'll touch the first fret and the last fret, just check the relief. In fact, this has got quite a severe hollow, so we're going to need to take the neck out and adjust the truss rod. The truss rod, in this particular case, is 
at the bottom end of the neck, unlike the Les Paul, which had the adjustment point here. Right, now, before I do that, I just want to check a few other things. And the most important thing, really, is the way the bridge saddles are set up. Because if we can have a, a camera in on here, I don't know if you can see that, but the actual individual Allen keys are set far too high. And as you're playing the guitar, they're bound to cut or scratch the side of your hand. So I'll place it down here again so that we can readjust this. Now, this is going to be Doc's tip number seven, adjusting the height of the strat bridge. As I've mentioned, we need to raise the action height on the strat, but we can compensate for this by changing the neck angle later. Now, I want to reflect the radius of the, of the fingerboard in the action height of the saddles. I'm going to slacken the strings off slightly so that I, I can uh, raise the action height without breaking the strings. There we go. Let's see here. Now doing it like this. Because the screws on the first saddle and the sixth saddle are slightly lower than on the middle saddles, you can reflect the camber fairly accurately and not pass through the actual pressed out body of the saddle. If you can get a close up of that, you can see the actual shape. It's, it's like a pressed piece of tin, really, I suppose you could call it. So you haven't really got a lot to play with when it comes to the height of the screws. If you screw them down too far, they'll come through the other side and fall out onto the floor. So now what I'm doing is adjusting them so that I've got them pretty much on their maximum setting. I've left myself a couple of turns so I can take it, take it either way. Finish slapping it off. Now that's going to be approximately the setting that uh, I'll want to end up with, so that when I'm playing the guitar, my hand's not grazed by the sharp edges on the, on the Allen screws. That's Doc's tip number seven. I've adjusted the bridge height, so I'm now going to measure the overall action. I can actually see that it's far too high. Yes, we've got 864th pretty much all the way along. Yes, which uh, means that I've actually got the camber set right on the bridge. Now, the only way that I can change the action height now is to remove the neck and place a shim under the last fret between the neck and the body. While I have the neck out, I'll adjust the truss rod. So the first step is to detune the strings, like so. I don't want to do it too much so that the strings pop out. Try to avoid it. It doesn't matter if, if that does happen because it's fairly easy to relocate them. Right. I'm going to place a strip of masking tape across the nut to prevent the strings from flying off, off from the top of the headstock. I think that should allow me enough. a large Phillips screwdriver to remove the neck bolts. I find holding it like this you can keep the assembly together even with the screws out so you're not likely to have the neck falling off and doing your head some damage. There you go. If you just required truss rod adjustment, it would be possible just to undo the screws slightly, lay it flat onto the bench, push the body each side, and then make your adjustment because the neck would pop out slightly and retighten the screws. But we do need a shim. 
because the actual height is uh, two extremes. Okay. Lay that down again. And be careful when you lift the neck out because some of the Fender Strat guitars or even the copies have quite a close fit into the into the body. And when you pull it out, you're liable to flake the paint. Now, actually, on this guitar, somebody's placed a shim, but right in the middle. I'm not quite sure what the point of that was. Right, what I'll do, I'll raise the guitar up so you can see the correct placement of the shim. I don't know whether you can, if you can get that. Just in this cavity here. So I'm going to place it right at the back, just under there. That's what I made earlier. That's there. So now I go and do the truss rod adjustment. Now, I don't know if you can bring the camera into the truss rod adjuster there. If you can see, it's designed for either cross head screwdriver or that head screwdriver. It's impossible to really judge how much adjustment's required as you haven't got any string tension on, but practice actually tells me that about half to three quarters of a turn on a strap, because it's a maple neck, it requires a bit more tension. Now, let's see this up here. This one's already fairly tight. And about half a turn is all I can manage without risking either stripping the thread or, or indeed breaking the truss rod. So now, as you can see, the procedure is actually fairly quick and fairly simple. Right, what I'll do now is just check that I haven't uh, got the strings in the wrong order, which is quite easy if we pass the neck through if the strings are the wrong way. Place it back together there. Just do a final check. Yep. Screw it back together again. There you go. You may find that some of the screws uh, continue turning. If that happens, what you need to do is take the neck out again and get a hardwood cocktail stick and fill the hole with that as a plug and dab a super glue in to hold them in and start again and that, that does the trick. As it happens these are fine. Right. Okay. One of the strings has actually popped out but that's no great problem. go. Put a little bit of tension on that. <clears throat> now I don't know how this is going to work out until I've got the string tension back on again. It may be that the shim is too great or that I've in fact adjusted the truss rod too much. If that's the case I'm, I will probably not have quite enough leeway on the bridge assembly to correct it, so I may indeed have to take it to pieces again. Sometimes it takes two or three attempts to actually get it right. Yeah. I might just have enough here. You can't really tell though until you've got a bit of tension on all the strings. But I, I left myself, as I say, at least a couple of turns on the bridge saddles to raise the action, so I'll take them now to the extremes to see whether, whether or not I can clear the last fret.
No. I'm going to have to take the mic out again. Right, I've got the correct size shim in, and the action is just about there. The next thing is to correct the string alignment. If you have a look here, you can see that the strings are biased towards the base side. And this is going to lead us into docs tip number eight, correcting the string alignment. What I'm about to do now may frighten a few of you, but it is actually the easiest way to correct poor alignment. If I press down on the end of the neck like this, you see the neck moves across. Don't need too much pressure, just enough to allow the strings and the neck to move to one side. That's corrected it. That's Doc's tip number eight. OK, I've corrected the alignment. Now we're going to have a closer look at the tremolo unit. As you can see, you've got pressed saddles here. We've already adjusted the height of these. The six intonation screws with their securing springs. And the six screws at the front here, which secure the bridge plate to the body. Now I'm just going to depress the tremolo arm down. This is the screw-in type on this style of tremolo unit. I can feel it's binding. It's fairly stiff, and it's more than just the tension of the springs. I actually believe it's due to the six screws at the front there binding onto the body. I'm in fact going to make this the subject of Doc's tip number nine. I'll quickly show you the screws we're going to adjust. We need approximately a 64th of an inch clearance from the plate to the underside of the screw head. There we go. Just lie it down again. Now, before I can do this, I need to slacken the strings off so that the bridge plate is lying flat on the body. As we can see here, yes, it is. Now then, I'm going to release each screw by about half a turn to start with. I can see the bridge plate's actually moving back even further now. Sitting absolutely flat on the body. It was lifting slightly to one side before. All right, now taking from the screw under the top E, yep. Again, this is a fairly quick and simple procedure. This will also prevent the tuning problems that you have with strats. This is the most common fault, the fact that these screws are done up too tight. They're not there to hold the tremolo unit absolutely fast to the body. They're there primarily to act as, as a balancing system for the tremolo. There we go, that should work perfectly. That's Doc's tip number nine. The next step is to set the tremolo up so that the bridge plate floats away from the body. This will enable you to move the tremolo arm backwards and forwards to raise and decrease the pitch. Now, obviously, the springs are in there to counteract the string tension, so we need to adjust the spring tension so that the plate can float. Now, I'll just measure the height of the plate. That's the bottom of the plate, the top of the body. And it's under string tension. It's sitting virtually flat, so the springs are actually far too tight. I'll just turn the guitar over so you can see the adjustment points here. Now, these are the two screws we need to adjust. Now, we need to slacken these off because we could see that the spring tension had pulled this tremolo block into the body. So, I'll just make a slight adjustment. Half a turn at a time should be sufficient. And I'll pick the guitar up and retune it. This is important because, as you can see, even that slight adjustments made an incredible difference to the pitch of the strings.
Now I can see that the plate is still sitting fast to the body, so I'll lay it down again, and this time I'll give it a whole turn for each screw. Retune. The plate's beginning to rise from the body now. Still not quite enough. I'm just judging this by eye at present. So it's a continual toing and froing from tuning and adjusting, tuning and adjusting. If you overshoot the mark, then you have to tighten it up, obviously, and reverse the procedure. there a little bit more it looks as if this guitar had never been set up properly to start with in fact that's quite common with uh, most new instruments the factory adjustments are always the most expensive part of the production so the setups generally are the bits that are left out Yes, now I can see that that's floating. Yes, we've got an eighth of an inch clearance there now from the top of the body to the underside of the bridge plate. And that will allow me now. now if you wish to pull the, uh, the strings up by about a tone, then you may need to increase that to about 3 sixteenths, that gap. But for, for the Hank Marvin style, an eighth of an inch is sufficient. Like the Les Paul, we've made all the basic adjustments. We've adjusted the truss rod and the bridge, and we're now about to do the nut. There's a slight difference between the nut on a Strat compared to that with the Les Paul, and this will lead us to Doc's tip number 10. We'll be using the saw we made from the junior hacksaw blade for this procedure. As with the Les Paul, the first fret clearance should be approximately the diameter of the string for the top three strings and the half the diameter for the bottom three. Okay, I'm going to lift the top string to one side. I'm using the junior hacksaw blade. Angled, don't forget to angle it the same way as we did with the Les Paul. This is a graphite nut. that makes very easy to cut the string, overcut this slot, shall I say. A little bit more. Most of them are actually fitted with white plastic nuts, which are a little bit more resistant to the blade than this is. That's fine. Keep the blade angled back so that the leading edge prevents the string from rattling in the slot. Now we'll go to the oval file for the bottom three strings. There we go, that's done. Doc's tip number 10. Before we complete the setup, there are one or two points that we should attend to. The first one is the frets are actually worn slightly and scratch quite badly up at the top here. So I'm going to detune the strings, lay them to one side and retain them with the plastic retainer I made earlier for the job. There's no need to remove the strings completely for this, you see. This is quite a useful tool. There, can you see that in position? Just remove them from there. Now the next step is to mask the fingerboard so that when you're sanding the frets, you're not going to damage the, the lacquer. 
it, obviously, if you've got a, a rosewood strat or a rosewood fingerboard, generally, you wouldn't need to mask it up because the wire will itself will remove any marks made by the sandpaper. Just a precaution, we'll do this. Okay, I've taped up the fingerboard and around the body. Now I'm going to use a sheet of 1000 grade wet or dry on the rubber block. And starting from the fingerboard nut end, up quite firmly because it's a very fine paper, remove the little indentations that uh, I think were caused by the owner of this guitar playing just one or two chords. There you go. Down at the bottom end there, are fairly deep, so I'll remove these. All the way along, evenly as possible. This will actually put a little bit of contour, a bit of a crown back onto the top of the fret, so they'll feel slightly smoother when you're playing. There we go. Go over the edge a bit as well. Because wood, as you know, has a tendency to shrink. And uh, quite often it leaves the fret ends exposed. So because you've masked up over the side, you can sand at an angle of 45 degrees and remove any sharp fret ends in the process. Back down again. that bit. Just re-secure the tape. Some of these procedures are a bit like watching the paint dry, but don't worry about it. Wire wool, triple O grade wire wool, which will remove the sandpaper marks and give you a final polish to the frets. Now that looks a lot better. So we'll use the paintbrush as well to remove the dust and the muck from all of this work. Right, we've got final tip before we finish the strat. Which I'll talk about this while I'm carefully removing the tape. And I say carefully remove the tape because if you use a, a high tack tape and leave it on for too long, it can actually pull off flakes of lacquer. Lacquer is only a few microns thick on the strap fingerboards. Right, the string trees are one of the main friction points in the Stratocaster. If we can have a close up of the string tree here, you can see that it's actually fixed securely to the headstock. I want to raise this up slightly, and this is going to be the subject of Doc's tip 11. To raise the height of the string tree, I'm going to use a piece of plastic tubing, or stiff plastic insulation, which I have here. I'm going to cut it approximately an eighth of an inch in length. There we go. That's fairly stiff. I'll place it on the headstock here so that you can see the height of it. There, that's fine. Take the screwdriver and remove the string tree. There we go. Thread that through. Just a bit smaller than the diameter of the screw, so that's perfect. Don't want to make it too long, otherwise you'll have to have a longer screw, but... There we go. Thread the strings under. You can lubricate the underside of the string tree there, the actual slots there, with either pencil lead or um, something like a lip seal, a Vaseline-based product. Should do. You can see the actual brake angle now over the nut is gentler than uh, it was before. So there's a 
less friction overall. That's uh, Doc's tip number 11. Right, we're almost there. I'll just look over the guitar for uh, any loose parts. We know the neck's all right. Let's just put that back on. Track socket's okay. Quite often you get a bit of play in the tremolo arm, and sometimes you can wind a piece of PTFE tape, the plumber's tape, around the thread to take up the slack. That's quite useful. Toggle switch caps quite often fall off. Uh, dab a super glue there will help. Oh, knobs come off my hand, but uh, we've all got problems, haven't we? Let's see what we can do about that. Now, I don't know whether we can have a close-up of the actual shaft of the pot there, but you see that it's a splined shaft and it has a slot in it. The idea of that is so that you can open it slightly. Be very careful, don't use too much pressure because you could snap it in half. Or I've, I was tempted to say I've snapped the shaft of my pot many a time, but I don't. Okay. Now, rotate it fully clockwise and then line up number 10. Let's point you. There we go. That's fine. Point at you. Everything else seems to be okay. Right, pick up height next. Now I can see that the pickup height is far too close to the bottom strings. Now this will create wolf notes. A wolf note is when you get uh, basically two notes together and you get the strange oscillating sound that occurs because the magnets themselves are actually the pickup's pole pieces and they suck the string down and, and create a node or point of no, no vibration. So it basically it's like a magic finger holding the string in that position. You can hear this if I just... It's also creating fret buzzes. It sucks the string down. I like to have these set down to about 3 sixteenths of an inch below the level of the string when you're holding it down. The last fret. That's on the bass side. There you go. And about sixteenth of an inch on the treble side. Again, because there's less mass, the magnets haven't really got as much to act upon to pull the string down. So you, you don't get that effect on the top string. You can hear that's a lot cleaner there now. That's fine. That's, that's working perfectly. The last thing to do is set the intonation and just check the action height and the, and the, the truss rod setting is still working fine. Right. Again, checking it at, at the 12th fret the harmonic. Compare it with the stop note. You can hear that's sharp. And with a strat, because you're actually pulling the saddle back and the string passes over the body, you have to slacken the string off virtually completely. Otherwise, you'll break it. Now, this needs to to move back at least an eighth of an inch. Retune. Still a little bit sharp. There we go. Now, as with the Les Paul bridge, the same rule applies. You should end up with two offset rows of bridge saddles. Now, I can approximate this to save us time, but it's best to check each one by ear as you do it. But this will be close enough for the purposes of the demonstration. That's 
sign. Now the G, B, and the E. G is actually not far out of position. The G string should always be set back a little further than the D string. Uh, that is because although the, there is more mass to the, the D string, there is actually less mass for the diameter, if you see what I mean. Because it's a solid string, and this one's a wound string, uh, you, you offset the mass by the fact that there's actually an air gap running between the, the wrap, so that uh, effectively for the gauge of the string, the G string actually has more mass than the D, therefore it requires to be offset slightly more than the D string. It's going to be close enough for this. Fine, now just do a final check on the action height. Get the guitar up. Because as with the Les Paul, every adjustment you make affects previous adjustments. I'll just check that, yes, we've still got an eighth of an inch clearance from the top of the body to the underside of the tremolo plate. I can lower the six string slightly. Fifth string's at four sixty-fourths. The D string actually requires to come up slightly. Again, retune every time to keep the balance correct. The G string is slightly low. If possible, if you can get away with it, you could have the top three strings around about 3 64ths, but because of the camber of the fingerboard, it's not always possible to do that, because as you bend the string, when it's at the, the crown of the camber, the actual saddle height is possibly lower than the center of the fingerboard, so you're eclipsing the next fret as you bend the string. But uh, nevertheless, try for 3 64 first of all and see what happens. We'll, we'll, I'll actually do this and see whether we get any cancellation when we bend. That's already at 3 and so is that. I'll just retune. Because this effect will be more noticeable above the 12th fret. So. That's what's happening when it's at 364s. You can hear the string is choking. B string is choking slightly. G string's fine, so I'll raise the height just slightly of the B and the top E string. That should cure the problem. If it doesn't, it could be that the fingerboard has a slight turn up at the end of the neck, and this will actually require dressing. Something again, which we're going to cover in future video. Let's just try this. It's always clean. There's, I think there's a high fret here. Yes, there is. Now, even though it is a, a maple fingerboard, a lacquered maple fingerboard, it's possible to tap the frets down. I'll just get the hammer from the toolbox in the far corner of the room. Right, just hold the strings to one side, and a gentle tap in that area should do it. Okay, that's cleaned it up. That's fine. Right, we've adjusted the action, set the tremolo so that it floats. Adjusted the truss rod. I'll just check that. 
by sighting it again. Yes, that's fine. Just a very, very slight curve forward. Approximately the diameter of the string clearance, as with the Les Paul. Slightly less of anything. You don't need to lubricate this nut. The reason being, it's a graphite one. But if you have a plastic one, you can either rub some pencil lead in uh, to act as a lubricant, or a lip seal, or just a tiny drop of Vaseline. That will do the trick. Um, We've raised the string tree. We've looked over for any loose components. We've reset the bridge so that, I don't know if we can bring a camera in on the bridge again. You can see now that the Allen key points are just about at the top of their adjustment so that when you rub your hand over, you're not going to, to graze your hand at all. And we've readjusted the neck pitch so that we obtain the correct action height Lowered the pickups on the base side, raised them on the treble side so that they're keeping the string balance, string volume balance, should I say, correct. I think this guitar now is just about perfect. I have a quick visual check over. The only thing we've left to do is put the back plate on at some time. I prefer to keep them off. It makes it easier to adjust if you want to change uh, your gauge of string. In fact, I find some gauges, even though they're the same gauge, different makes, uh, have a slightly different pull. And you quite often, when you get to a gig, need to adjust the springs to get the tremolo to float in the correct place. There we go. The fender finished. The third and final guitar is the Ibanez Gem. It looks strikingly different from the Les Paul and the Strat, but in many respects it's similar. It obeys the same principles uh, for truss rod, um, action height and nut, etc. In fact, I'm just going to have a quick look at the guitar. Check the neck. In fact, the neck on this is pretty much perfect. It's a very, very slight hollow. In fact, slightly less than the actual diameter of the string there. The action height on these guitars, they can be slightly lower than the Strat or the Les Paul because the camber of the fingerboard, especially at the top, is actually fairly flat. So when you're bending a string, you don't get the cancellation problem. I generally try for an action of 2 64ths on the 12th fret at the treble side and 4 64ths or less, even 3 64ths on the bass side. Yes, that's 3 there. And 2... Yeah, so the action height is fine. I know the strings require changing. And uh, we'll look at the differences, which do include the, uh, the bridge, slight differences in the bridge and the nut. We'll look at these in a second. The fingerboard nut on any locking tremolo system comprises of three or more pressure plates, which actually clamp the strings to the mass of the nut assembly. I'll just remove these. They shouldn't be uh, over-tightened, because if there are any sharp edges at all, especially on the leading edge there, then it can actually break the string. And sooner or later, you'll, you'll uh, damage the thread, or indeed the bolt. Yeah. Now, you check the first fret clearance the same fashion as you did with the uh, Les Paul and the Strat. And this actually could do with the shim being slightly changed, because slightly smaller shim, I mean, because it's slightly larger than the diameter of the string's clearance of the top three and almost the diameter of the string for the bottom three, which is far too much. Now, the way we remove this, I turn the guitar over, you can see that two bolts hold the whole assembly together. The reason for that is you cannot just glue this type of nut into place because um, when you de when you depress the tremolo arm, the tension of the strings ab above the nut, leading to the machine heads, would pull it out of place. So that has to be bolted or screwed into, into position. So what I'll do is turn the guitar over, take off the string tension, there we go. 
here. I'm going to remove the remove the knot. That should be enough there. Turn it back over again. And I've got the right size Allen key for this. Slacken it slightly and remove the bolts. Now these generally, as I mentioned, have metal shims underneath, but uh, you can use a thousand grade wet or dry sandpaper as a thin shim. As you take them out, be careful to observe whether or not you've got a locking washer, which we have on this, and there's a plain washer as well. The plain washer goes at the bottom always. Worst thing you can do is turn it over suddenly and lose all the bits, or end up with a pile of bits that you're not quite sure where they came from. So that I'll keep the whole assembly together. Turn over. It's the washers have just fallen away there. I can put them down there. Now the nut should just pull out. Turn the strings over. Slacken the tension off just a bit more. If you notice, there's a little tension bar behind the nut. And this is so that it follows, the string follows the curve of the locking nut so that when you clamp the plate to it, it doesn't deviate the tuning at all. Let's see what we have here now. It's a little bit fiddly, this operation. Best time to do this really is when you're changing the, the string so you can cut the strings off and you don't have this problem. But yes, you see here we've got one, one little plate. I'll need to slip something underneath that. I'll just go and cut something the right size. All right, I've got a suitable piece of material to make a slightly thinner shim than the original one. And here we go. I'm using the original shim, in fact, as a template for cutting out the new shim. Here we go. Follow the original as close as possible so that you don't have any sharp edges. Cut your fingers on when you're playing. Press out there now. There we go. And I'll just put the guitar back in position and we'll slip this under and refit the nut. Okay, I've got the guitar back in position and I've put the shim underneath. I'm just going to feed the strings back over. So we can check to see that it's going to be the right height. That's fine. Turn the guitar over there. Drop the plain washers in first. Right, and then the locking washers. Now, do them up just gentle just gentle pressure because we'll need to turn the guitar over to check that the strings can go back in properly. We haven't, in fact, clamped the unit onto one of the strings. And also that the alignment of the nut is correct because there's a bit of play there, if you can see that. And I generally find it's better to bias it towards the base side. There's nothing worse than having the top string slipping over the edge of the fingerboard. There we go. So that should be fine there. I'll turn it back and lock it off. Right, holding it over towards the base side. Okay, that should be fine. Right, I'll quickly put the string tension back on so we can just check the nut height again. There we 
Okay. You may notice that uh, I've tied the strings on in the same fashion as the as Paul. The reason for that is that um, I generally try to get the guitar as playable as possible before I clamp the plates into position over the strings. Reason being that when you then slacken them off to make any slight adjustments, you're not going to get a sudden two or three tone drop in pitch. Right, that's fine. Yes, let's take it down to absolutely the correct height. Floyd Rose tremolo differs from the Strat tremolo in several points. First is, of course, the obvious one that you've got just two overall height adjustments, as I mentioned earlier. The fact that as it's a locking system, you need to be able to adjust the tuning after the strings are locked off, and so there are your fine tuners, which actually press down onto little bars, which are linked to a cam-type system there. So as you press it, it stretches the string and, in fact, raises the pitch. Quite simple but very effective. This same bar or same bolt is used to clamp the string into position here. So when you change the string, you cut the ball end off and slip it in and tighten it. I'll actually demonstrate how to restring one of these style tremolos in, in, in a moment. The intonation's a little bit different. You don't, you don't use a screwdriver. Again, you use an Allen key to do the job. And the Allen bolts which secure the saddle into position are right at the front. In fact, they're in the same position that the bridge plate securing screws were on the Strat. So they're not to be confused with those because they actually do to a totally different job. What I'll do now is go on to Doc's tip number 12 before we change the strings. And that is by placing little rubber block under the back of the tremolo when you release the string tension the tremolo sits perfectly into position and it's much easier to bring it up to pitch without spending hours doing any fine tuning that's Doc's tip number 12 fine well we go straight on to detuning the guitar I need to take enough tension off here so that uh, we can undo the bolts without any fear of the strings flying, flying up and hitting us in the face. There we go, just half a turn is enough generally to release the string. Okay, I'll move this out to one side for a second, then I can show you how we'd prepare and fit one of the new strings. Starting with the top string, here we just cut the ball end off about half an inch away from the end of the string. Not much further because you'd be surprised how long the string needs to be even when you've even though you've cut a bit off. Right. Poke the string in vertically the right place there. And then carefully clamp it, clamp it up. Alright, get it to the point where it bites and then another half turn. That's all you need. Any more than that and you'll break the string. That's fine. You repeat the procedure for all six strings. Okay, we've strung the guitar up just got to check the intonation and uh, show you how it differs from the Strat. Now 
and mainly it's the top two strings that I've got a problem with. Now, the only way we can do the intonation adjustment is to slacken the string off completely because the whole saddle carriage slides forward when I undo the intonation screw. Having slackened it off, push it back slightly. A little bit of guesswork involved here as uh, you can't really do any measurements. It's very much a trial and error job. That's much better. Now, just do the second string. Again, push the saddle back. Just need to slacken that off slightly more. Don't know if you can see this clearly, but there we go. Never, never over tighten these screws because you'll end up having a very short lifespan with all the hardware. Let's just try this now. Yes, that's fine. I'm just going to have a quick look to check the, the floating action of the tremolo. In fact, it, it needs to come up slightly. So, again, similar principle to that of the Strat. You've got the two screws in the back there. Take this, can you see that all right? Two screws in the back, which I slacken off slightly because I need the bridge to lean slightly forward, so therefore the string tension will take up the take up the slack. Retune to pitch. <laughs> slightly more. It's always a case, really, of going backwards and forwards over each operation until you achieve the desired result. Yes, that's fine. Now, with this particular tremolo unit, you haven't really got anything to measure, and you have to look at, along at the bottom edge, if you can see it here, and just check that that is flush with the body surface. So, in actual fact, the top plate here appears to be angling up at about 30 degrees. When it looks like that, then it's about right. Some of the Floyd Rose style tremolos actually have a parallel plate, and you just get the plate to float parallel to the body. Um, you can have it leaning slightly forward, but within four or five degrees either way is acceptable. If it leans back too far, when you pull the tremolo arm up, you'll find that the strings will bottom out on the intonation adjustment screws and the note will die. So that's something to be aware of. Right. That's fine. We've adjusted the uh, spring tension to put the bridge in the correct place. The truss rod's fine. I'll just... One... We'll look down the neck. Yes, that's okay. Check here, that's all right. Intonation's been done. We've raised the locking nut. It's okay there. I'll do the pickup heights, which I'll just do briefly. Um, again, it's the same as for the Gibson. You want it slightly down on the base side, approximately an eighth of an inch on the base side, which this virtually is, and about sixteenth on the treble side, a bit closer if you like. These are ceramic magnets, and the ceramic magnets have a more focused field and a slightly brighter sound, so you don't really necessarily need them as close as you would do an Alnico magnet pickup. And the single coil pickup, same as for the Strat, as far away as possible on the base side and about sixteenth of an inch or so on the treble side. Now that's fine. That should be perfectly playable now.
if not perfectly in tune. That's the last of the guitars. Um, and in a moment we're going over to recap and have a look at all three and just point out the differences and the similarities between them. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video, especially the docs tips. Bear in mind that although the guitars look radically different, they are in essence the same. And anything that you can't adjust with either a small screwdriver, Allen key, or file, requires remedial work that hopefully we'll be doing in the near future in another video. All of the adjustment points, whether it be for the neck, the bridge, the pickups or nut, they count for these guitars plus many more that are out there. Whether they be a bass guitar or an acoustic guitar, they all obey the same laws. It just leaves me really to wish you good luck and hope we meet again in a future video.